You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is time for Searching Scripture. We'll get to that with Pastor Roth in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Carl Roth, pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Elgin, Texas. He is also author of Searching Scripture column in the Lutheran Witness each month this year. Pastor Roth, welcome back to The Coffee Hour. Delighted to be with you again. We are continuing our study in First Peter, and today we're going to wrap up chapter one and break into chapter two. What a, you want to give us a, a little bit of a, I guess, a summary, a, a, an overview of what we'll be looking at today? Yeah, I think I'd like to highlight that this issue of Lutheran witnesses focused on the theme of being a hopeful community, and this is one of the major themes of first the first epistle of Peter as well. The, the theme of hope. But the word hope in English today is is somewhat ambiguous, maybe even a little bit degraded. So I might say, I hope the Astros win the World Series this year. And, you know, that's a reasonable hope because, you know, they've done pretty well the last few years, but it's very uncertain. So hope today tends not to expe- convey certainty, but in the Bible, hope does convey certainty. In fact, it might be better translated as expectation or, or waiting so it's just patient waiting for God's reliable word to be fulfilled. And so particular section of First Peter we're looking at today emphasizes the unchanging, reliable nature of God's word. And that's what undergirds our hope. Hope, our community of hope, a community of the word. All right, we're in First Peter chapter 1 today. Would you like to read the text for us, Pastor, as we get started? Certainly. 1 Peter 1, 22 through 2, 3. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of our Lord's remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. All right, let's jump into question one. Lutherans tend to think of obedience as adherence to God's law, which would be part of our sanctification rather than our justification. But sometimes in the New Testament applies obedience, not to the law, but to faith or the standard of teaching. What does obedience refer to in 1 Peter 1 verse 22? Also see Romans 1 verse 5 and 6 verses 17 and 18. All right. So one of the ways you can tell whether something is law or gospel is its effects. You can work from its effects back to the cause. And since Peter begins this sentence by saying, having purified your souls, that's the effect. You have to ask yourself the question, could the law have caused that? So could my obedience to the law bring about the purification of my soul? Well, certainly not. The law shows us our sins. And so that tells us then that the purification process has to be caused by the gospel. That's what saves us. And so when Peter uses the term obedience to the truth, he has to be using it in a slightly different way than I than we'd say maybe my child obeys the rules that I set in the household and must follow them, otherwise he will be punished. Here, the sense of the term is more synonymous with faith, actually, because the actual Greek word for Obedience comes from a a verb that means to hear under authority. And so obedience really does, first of all, mean to hear. And then as the the belief will then lead to particular actions. So obedience to the truth here really means faith in the truth. This is quite similar to the way Paul uses the term obedience in Romans 1 and Romans 6. In Romans 1, he says that he had received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. There, we actually have faith and obedience used together. This could be faith's obedience, or this could be obedience to the faith. And so this is putting our our hearing 
in the Christian faith, the faith that St. Paul has put down in Scripture, faith with a capital F. And then in Romans 6, Paul says, we have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we're committed. Our heart then clings in faith to the teaching that we've received. So I really like what Paul also says in, in Galatians about the truth of the gospel is the thing that must be preserved. And so obedience to the truth, obedience to the truth of the gospel is really our faithful hearing it, and then that will lead to good works. Was that pretty clear? Yes, it was clear. I think you, you made some helpful distinctions that was that was insightful. Well, my, my main point is that Lutherans hear the term obedience and oftentimes think that that is always associated with the law, but realize that sometimes the New Testament does connect obedience to our relationship with the gospel. Very good. Question number two, in what way do John chapter one, verses 12 through 14 and John chapter three, verses one through 15, illuminate how we have been born again through the word of God, which is in first Peter chapter one, verse 23. All right, Andy and Sarah, I've got a question for you. Did either of you choose to be born? No. No. What? All right. Yeah, I don't think so. Gotta... <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you had this. It was consul... a strong willed child, but no. <laughs> yeah, right. None of us had this consultation with our parents, you know. That now, now would be a good time to have a child, you know, like, no, this is a, an, an absurd question, right? And I really like to point out how John chapter one says, that those who believe in Christ receive the right to become children of God and were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but were born of God. So we do not choose to be born of our parents, nor do we choose to be born of God. And here in, in 1 Peter, he said that we've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and act, abiding word of God. So it's God's word that comes to us from the outside that gives us new life, gives us rebirth, and that has nothing to do with our own decision. John 1 also says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is the word who comes to us through the word and the sacraments that is the one who regenerates us. And a little bit later in John, you've got the famous scene with Nicodemus and Nicodemus, Jesus says, you got to be born again. Nicodemus says, well, how can I enter my mother's womb again and be born? And Jesus said, no, you have to be born of water and the spirit. So we are born again in baptism. We're born again through the word of God, all by God's choosing, by his grace. Um, and so this really takes away the, I, any idea that it's our works that contributes to our salvation in the slightest. All right. Question three. Isaiah 40, verse six and eight are quoted in First Peter 1, verses 24 and 25 followed by the assertion that the proclaimed good news, gospel, is God's abiding word. How does Isaiah 40 verses 1 through 5 support Peter's claim about the gospel? Which New Testament figures are mentioned in this prophecy? And we should note there's a typo here in the print edition of the Lutheran Witness. This should be 1 Peter 1, not 1 Peter 2. Oh, yes. So Isaiah 40 actually kind of takes us back to Advent. You know, Isaiah 53 would be more Lent, which we're firmly uh, in the middle of right now. But Advent, Isaiah 40 is a crucial passage for this because it introduces the figure of John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness crying out and preparing the way for the Lord. And so Isaiah 40 verses 1 through 8 is, is one of the readings that we have back in Advent that prepares us for the, the coming of our Lord. And it, it shows us the good news. You know, John the Baptist, we associate with the law, kind of a hellfire and brimstone type preacher. But since he's proclaiming Jesus, preparing the way for him, we know that he's a preacher of good news. And that's what we see in our text from First Peter, that it is the, the word of the Lord that remains forever is the good news that was preached to you. Good news means gospel. And so Isaiah is one of the most magnificent prophecies of the Old Testament. And in it, it shows in Isaiah 40, forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, comfort for God's people. And so first Peter is connected tightly to, to Isaiah with this living and enduring word of God that is the gospel. All right, let's take our pause here before we go on to question four because I want to give you plenty of time to get into question four as well. So let's do that. We are searching scripture with Pastor Roth today 
in the March issue of The Lutheran Witness. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are in the March issue of The Lutheran Witness with Searching Scripture. Our guest today, Pastor Carl Roth, pastor at Grace Lutheran Church in Elgin, Texas. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1 and chapter 2 today, wrapping up chapter 1 and making our way into chapter 2. Pastor Roth, ready for question 4? You bet. All right. How does Jesus emphasize the enduring nature of his word in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35? What should we be willing to sacrifice for the sake of his word? And why is such a sacrifice worthwhile? See Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. All right. So Matthew 24, 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away. And this is Jesus speaking. But my words will not pass away. This really tightly connects in with what we had just heard in the previous verse, the word that the, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Maybe you've seen on stained glass windows or in woodcuts, VDMA, verbum domini monet in aeternum, the word of the Lord remains forever. This is a really significant part of our Lutheran confession of faith because we believe in sola scriptura. The word of God alone is the foundation for our faith and our practice. And Jesus says, even if everything else in all of the creation falls apart, his words will not pass away. What a comfort that is then as we approach the Holy Scriptures and as we go to the sacraments, and which are the word of God attached to a visible element, and realize these are the things that are going to carry us through this life beyond the grave and into resurrection and life everlasting. And that really highlights then why this word is so worth sacrificing for and in fact suffering for. In Mark 8, Jesus shows that it would be foolish to try to even gain the whole world, but in the process, give up his soul. Jesus said, all that's going to go away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And then he also gives us a warning. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and this is adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man also will be ashamed of him on judgment day. So it's a package deal. With Jesus, you don't get to pick Jesus or his word, one or the other. It's a package deal. We have to take Jesus as he's given us his words and scriptures. Those are the things that we're not to be ashamed of, but rather to boldly confess. To re- And in fact, they're given to rejoice in. As Peter has told us, the, gosp- the good news is the word that we have heard. The gospel is always good news for us. It's always wonderful and brings joy to our, our hearts, to our new man. And so it's nothing to be ashamed of. But it is Jesus also this give us this warning that we can't try to separate him from his word. And so we always have access to him through the word. All right, question five. Like Paul, Peter sometimes moves directly from proclamation of the gospel to moral admonition, often with logical connectors like so or therefore, as he does in 1 Peter 2 verse 1. Why are the prohibitions in this verse necessary for Christian communities? See Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Yeah, so Peter, like Paul, proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ, but then says there's going to be a natural outgrowth of believing this. Faith is going to lead to good works. And so the Christian community, if it's going to be a community surrounded, gathered around the word, and is going to be a hopeful community, We've got to put away malice because the devil would love to stir up malice among us. Deceit, the devil, of course, being a liar and the father of lies. Hypocrisy, envy, and slander. All of these are vices that can tear apart the Christian communities. And so we need to be living in constant 
watchfulness against these things, vigilance, repentance when we run into them. We see something very similar. We get a very similar list in Colossians 3, where Paul talks about all the, the bad things that we need to set aside. And then we need to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, and patience. And he, he tells us that we will be brought together as one body, one thankful body in Christ Jesus as we do these things. Let the word of Christ, this is Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we've got the prohibitions against those vices because those are things that tear down the community. And then we've got the positive encouragements to worship, to use the word of God, to sing, and to admonish each other. Those are the things that are going to build us up together in one body as a hopeful community in Christ. All right. Question number six. According to Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, how are both our entrance into God's kingdom and our growth as Christians similar? Also reflect on how the small catechism's explanation of baptism emphasizes these two aspects of the Christian life. All right, so let me just go ahead and read to you Luke eighteen fifteen to 17. Now they were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Well, we had just seen in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, like newborn infants. And so we've got similes here comparing believers to in little children and infants in both cases. And this, of course, we're going to connect to baptism. This verse from Luke 18, we'll oftentimes hear the parallel account of this from Mark's gospel read at infant baptisms to highlight the fact that bringing little ch children to Jesus in baptism uh, is what he's really telling his church to do in that verse. Um, inf infants provide to us the perfect expression of how God's grace works. All little babies can do when they come to Jesus, they can't do any works for him. They can't do anything good for him. All they can bring to him is their helplessness, right? They have nothing to offer. And I was telling my confirmation students yesterday, you know, like the most they could probably offer is they might accidentally poop in their diaper while they're being baptized, right? And then, of course, they all thought that was gross. And it is gross, right? But that's how much God loves us. You know, he became, God sent his son to become an infant who went through all those stages of life, who did soil his diaper, who was down here in the dirt with us, grew up and lived through this kind of smelly, tangible existence, suffered and died for us, rose on Easter, showed his disciples his hand in his side, invited them to touch him. Our God comes down to us in the flesh and he, he shows his great love for all humanity by reaching down and laying his hands on these little infants and showing us that they're the perfect example of the disciple, not because they're perfect and pure, because we are conceived and born sinful, but they're the perfect example of the disciple because they have nothing to offer and they're passive recipients of his grace. And so he says that being great in the kingdom of God is not about anything you do. It's about what you receive, receiving his grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And in fact, that's the only way to get into the kingdom, Jesus says. If you don't receive the kingdom of God like a child, you're going to never enter it. So the Bible never says that there are any adults of God, right? There's only children of God. And our catechism also really beautifully emphasizes how baptism is this gracious washing of regeneration and renewal and new birth in the Holy Spirit that gives us a new life. And again, it's just this wonderful expression of God's grace. All right. Question seven. Peter alludes to Psalm 34, eight with the words, you have tasted that the Lord is good. First Peter two, verse three. Net New Testament quotations from and allusions to the Old Testament should lead us back to their source for deeper understanding. How does Psalm 34 teach us to taste the Lord's goodness? Okay, so as we're in Lent now, this as you, you come up on, at my church at least, after the Holy Thursday 
stripping of the altar after the communion service, the pastor will chant Psalm 22 and Mm -hmm. chant the entire thing. And then the next day, you'll hear the reading of the Passion of Christ, and Jesus will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's Psalm 22, verse 1. Now, Psalm 22 is actually 30-some verses long, and if you'd heard it the night before, what you'd realize when Jesus is crying those words out from the cross, he has, he's intending to, to have us look at the entire psalm. And while the psalm begins on a note of apparent hopelessness, and abandonment by God, it ends on a note of triumph. And so if you don't follow that psalm all the way through, based off of the New Testament reference to it, you might miss something. Recognize that on the cross, Jesus wasn't despairing. He rather was fulfilling prophecy. He knew that his father was going to save him. The answer to the question, my God, my God, why do you forsake, have you forsaken me? The answer to that is in order to save us sinners. And then the rest of the psalm shows us how he did that. So I use that as an example of, of how in First Peter, when he mentioned Psalm 34, we should actually go and read the entire psalm. And so that's what I encourage each of you to do today, because Psalm 34 is a little bit too long for us to go through altogether. But again and again, this psalm talks about how those who are in desperation, the Lord cry, they cry out to the Lord. He saves them out of their troubles, and the angel of the Lord is around them. They can taste and see the Lord is good by eating his, his wonderful word, by taking refuge in him. He says, listening to the Lord, listening and being taught the fear of the Lord is something that is going to feed and nourish our souls. And the, we also receive the promise then that the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are always toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The faces of, on the other hand, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to, to cut off the memory of them. So we're reminded then that the Lord is on our side. He's by our side upon the plain with his good words and fear, spirit, but he's also fighting against our enemies. So this is a wonderful psalm for reminding us that the Lord is in control and we taste and see that he is good by studying his word and every Sunday very tangibly by receiving his body and blood in the Lord's Supper. Final thoughts on 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through chapter 2, verse 3 today, Pastor? Well, there is law and there is gospel, as Peter's a master of the art. And so he does remind us with the, those words quoted from Isaiah 40, all flesh is like grass and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the work. So, so the glass, and what is the grass? Well, if you read Isaiah 40, it tells you it's people. <laughs> We're the grass. And so we are all withering. We are all falling. We are all going to die. But then he says, the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So we, though we are but grass and ultimately are dust and ashes, we just heard a couple of weeks ago on Ash Wednesday, you are, to du- you are dust and to dust you shall return. Even though that's true, the more important uh, truth is the gospel and, and the hope that we have in Christ and as as Paul puts it, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And so through Christ, as Peter tells us, you are believers in God who rose, raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. There's nothing uncertain about this hope. It's sure. It's reliable. It's an expectation that we have and are simply waiting for that day to come and knowing that the Lord will sustain us until that time. Searching Scripture in the March issue of The Lutheran Witness, our guest today, Pastor Carl Roth of Grace Lutheran Church in Elgin, Texas. Pastor Roth, thanks so much for being our guest on The Coffee Hour. You're very welcome. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golta. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. 
You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to KFUO.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to KFUO.org slash store.